youth and our kids. Well, welcome to, to week eight of our summer sermon series called Disciplines of Disciples. Throughout the summer, we've been looking at a variety of spiritual gifts and spiritual disciplines, sorry, not gifts, spiritual disciplines, that are a blessing and a benefit to our ongoing relationship with God. And these spiritual disciplines assist our walk with the Lord to, to help us maintain our relationship with Jesus, even when we can't see him. So even as Whitney demonstrated that with, with her dad uh, walking through that maze for, for the kill, children's sermon, the Holy Spirit does the same thing to us. He helps us navigate through this world, and he helps us to know when to do the different spiritual disciplines and how to apply them to our lives. And so uh, that's a very applicable, applicable thing that she demonstrated today as well. Remember that we're using the term disciplines not in a punitive sense where there's punishment. We're using it in a positive sense to mean to train or to develop by instruction and repeated practice. That's what we want to do. We want to continue to put these disciplines into practice. I can teach you about you. I can teach you teach about it. You can read books about it. But guess what? It doesn't make any difference if you don't go and do them. You have to put these spiritual disciplines into repeated practice. This is the eighth and final week of our sermon series. And after today, we will have covered eight different spiritual disciplines that disciples of Jesus Christ employ in their lives to help us stay in step with the Lord, to help us continue that relationship with him. And, and that's what we have been talking about. There are more than eight spiritual disciplines. You need to know that. I haven't covered all of them. I haven't uh, even come close to exhausting the list. But these will help us get started. If we'll put these into practice, they'll help us to get started as we continue to move for forward in our relationship with God. And as we continue to hone that relationship, and as the Holy Spirit uh, draws us closer in, he'll show us more and more of those disciplines, or he'll bring those to light in your life as well. So you can trust him to do that. Each of these spiritual disciplines that we've talked about give us tangible ways to put our faith in Jesus into action. They give us real things to do. Read our Bible, pray, fast, do these things that we talked about, serve others, worship, all those things that we've already talked about. They give us tangible things that we can do with our faith and say, this is how we want to live it out. And as we put those things into action, we grow deeper and, and more intimate in our relationship with God. And it's an amazing way that that happens for each and every one of us. And it's the Holy Spirit, as we've been saying all summer long, who is, our, who is like our personal trainer who helps us to apply the right disciplines at the right time. And he'll say, hey, I need you to do this today. Or, hey, I want to call you to a season of fasting. Or, hey, I want to call you to serve others the way that Jesus did. And, he, and he'll call us to do those things. I encourage you, continue to listen to the Holy Spirit's leading in your life because he's the one that will help you through these things and know when to apply them. And today's discipline is no different uh, than any of the others in that manner. So the spiritual discipline that I want to talk about today is evangelism. I want to talk about evangelism today. Uh, let me just give you a quick definition of what that means. Evangelism uh, is proclaiming to others the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. It's telling others that, that, that God sent his son to die for us and that through him we have salvation. That is good news. That is something that we want to share with others, and that's what evangelism is. It's proclaiming that good news to other people. Evangelism is needed because whether you have picked up on it or not in your lifetime, there are many other people who need to hear about God's love and the salvation from sin that he provides through Jesus Christ. Each new generation needs to know that. Did you know that? Anybody know there's been people that were born before you? Anybody know that? How many of you are sitting around some of those people? How many of you know there's people who were born after you? A few of you? Almost everyone should know that. The, uh, every new generation who is born doesn't yet know the Lord. And every new generation needs to be told of the love of God, that, and as he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for their sins too. We're, it's, we're, it's told in, in church history classes and stuff, we're really only one generation from a godless society. Do you know that? If one generation doesn't tell the next, and doesn't tell the next, and doesn't tell the next, we're only one generation away from people not knowing God at all. It's come close to happening before. We don't want to let it happen on our watch. So we're called to evangelize. We're called to share the gospel with other people around us. 
during Jesus' ministry on earth, he modeled for us sharing this good news with others. Jesus was the one through whom this salvation would come. He's the one that God sent as the Savior. But guess what? That wasn't enough. He also went and told other people about the good news. So even though he was the good news, even though he was the Savior, he spent his time telling other people about the good news that salvation had come through him. So let's look at uh, how Jesus, we read the words of Jesus, and we hear a testimony of him evangelizing other people. And uh, it's in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 through 38, and it says this, Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. Jesus models evangelism for us while he's here on earth. And yet he knows, even though he's the son of God, and even though he's going town to town for the areas that he can cover, he knows that there's more people to reach than he can reach personally while he's here on the earth. And that's an amazing thing. He knows that that the message of God's love and salvation needs to go further than even he can take it. That's an amazing thing to understand. And Jesus says the workers are few. Do you know why? It's not just because it was him and the disciples at the time. It's because all uh, the workers are few because the believers in God are always outnumbered by the number of unbelievers in this world. Did you know that? From the time Jesus walked until now, the number of unbelievers always outnumbers the believers. Do you know why? Because every person who is born is an unbeliever and needs to be told the gospel message. So we are always outnumbered. But do you know the outnumbering thing? Let me just talk about that. This is a bonus for a second. The workers are few because it's supposed to include all the believers, not just the pastors and the missionaries. Did you know that? Some of us read that verse and we think, oh, the workers are few because it's only the pastor and the missionaries. No, 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 no. Jesus says the workers are few, but the harvest is great because he's speaking about all of his disciples, all of his followers. We are still outnumbered, even if you count all of us. And guess who he calls to share the good news? Spoiler alert, all of us. And we're still outnumbered. If you only uh, matched up the pastors and the missionaries, we'd be vastly outnumbered. But guess what? He includes all of you as well as people who are sent to share the gospel, and still the workers are few. Yet it was God's design that from the very beginning that everyone would have a chance to come to know him. He knows that we're outnumbered. He knows that we're at work sharing the good news. And it's been his desire from the very beginning that every single person would have a chance to come to know him. We see God's choice, we see this displayed in God's choice and his blessing of Abraham when he calls Abram to to follow him. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, we read this. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous And you will be a blessing to others. You will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on the earth will be blessed through you. All the families on the earth will be blessed through you. God's desire from the very beginning was that all the families, that includes yours, that includes your neighbors, that includes everyone who's sitting around you and everybody that you work with and everyone who's born. God desires that all of them would come to know him. We see an example of another nation having the privilege of coming to know him when we see the nation of Israel, sorry, when we see the nation of Egypt 
um, dealt with in Exodus as God calls for his people to be released. In Exodus 7, 5, we read this. And it says, when I raise my powerful hand, and this is the Lord's hand, when I raise my powerful hand and bring out the Israelites, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. I don't know if you remember when we were going through the time frame of the Bible and we had covered Exodus and over and over and over again, the Lord says, I'm doing this that they would know me. I'm doing this that they would know me. And he does that for, gen- uh, for, for nation after nation after nation. In the, in the Old Testament, he desires that everyone would come to know him. And he has desired that from the very beginning of time. God always desired that more people would come to know him. But here's the most important part. His method for reaching them uh, is through contact with his current faithful followers. Think about that for just a minute. God has desired from the very beginning that more people would come to know him. But his chosen method for doing that is you and me. It's through contact with his current faithful followers. And they're supposed to be the ones telling the people around them. And those people are supposed to tell the people around them. And those people are supposed to tell around the people around them. What an amazing plan God has put into place to make sure everyone has the chance to come to know him. This is why God chose the nation of Israel to demonstrate his love and salvation to and through. That they might go and and share and demonstrate that to others. It's why Jesus traveled through many towns and many villages because a few was not enough. He wanted everyone to come to know the salvation that was coming uh, through him. That's why the first disciples, when we studied the life of the disciples, that's why they went to the furthest places of the earth on, during their lifetimes, carrying the good news about Jesus Christ after he rose from the dead and he send that, sent them out. And we studied that when we studied their lives about how they spread across the, the known world at the time to share the good news of Jesus Christ. It's why there are missionaries all over the world. Because more people need to know, but the chosen method is through his current followers. This is why God calls all of us, all of us as his people, to share the good news with those he places before us as well, no matter the location. Whether it's your home or your church, where you recreate, uh, where you go to school, for the kids, any of those things. God's design is that we would carry the message with us everywhere we go. And we, uh, you, so let me get to this here. God wants all of those people to know him. Your enemies, he wants them to know him. You, you, your best friend, he wants them to know him. Your neighbors, he wants them to know him. Everyone you come in contact with, the Lord wants them to know him. And guess what? You are God's plan for reaching the unbelievers of this world with the message of salvation through Jesus Christ. His plan is not just pastors and missionaries. That's a part of the plan. But guess what we're supposed to do? Tell you to go tell others the good news. And I tell you the good news so you can go and tell others the good news. So guess what? You are God's plan to reaching the unreached in this world. You need to know that, and we need to own that as God's children. We see this played out in the first generation of Christ followers who take up this responsibility of sharing the good news everywhere they go. Even in the midst of losing homes and being persecuted, the thing that they carry with them is the message of Jesus Christ. We see this played out in Acts chapter 8, verses 4 through 5, where we read this. But the believers who were scattered, preached the good news about Jesus everywhere they went. Philip, for example, went to the city of uh, Samaria and told the people there about the Messiah. As the believers, the new believers are persecuted and they scatter, they go sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, even though that's what made them scatter. That's what they were being persecuted for, and they didn't stop. They kept sharing the good news about Jesus Christ. 
And it's all the believers who are scattered, but it's also the disciples. And so the disciple Peter himself responds to an invitation by a Gentile, a, a, a God-fearing Jew, or sorry, a God-fearing Gentile, uh, a Roman army officer called Cornelius. And Cornelius sends men to, to, to Peter, and, and he invites Peter to come to his house. And he says, Peter, come and share the message that you have for me and for my family. And Peter shares with Cornelius and his family the good news that God's salvation is for every people group on the earth, for every nation who believes in Jesus Christ. Cornelius wasn't, was, wasn't a Jew. He was a Gentile. And Peter's saying, this message of salvation is for everyone. Listen as we hear uh, Peter give this message this morning. It's in Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through uh, 43. Listen to the message that, that we have that Peter gives Cornelius this day. When Peter, then Peter replied, I have seen very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. This is the message of good news for the people of Israel, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after John began his message of baptism. And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all those who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we, apostles, are witnesses of all he did throughout Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on the cross, but God raised him to life on the third day. Then God allowed him to appear, not to the general public, but to us, whom God had chosen in advance to be his witnesses." We are those who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach everywhere and to testify that Jesus is the one appointed by God to be the judge of all, the living and the dead. And he is the one all the prophets testify about, saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. That's, Paul, uh, that's uh, Peter's message to, Cor to Cornelius, and that's the message to us today, that God's desire is for everyone to come to know him. For everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. That is some good news, because you know who that includes? Me. You know who that includes? You. And you should say, me too, because that includes everyone. Who believes? My friends, that is some good news. So just as we heard uh, the early believers and Peter uh, speak and demonstrate these things, we too need to spread the good news about Jesus because there are people all over the world who are waiting to hear the message just like Cornelius and saying, please come and share the message that you have. Come and share what changed your life. Come and share what gave you hope, what gives you power in your life. Please come and share that with me. Share what changed your life and what will change my life too. They may not ask in so many words, but they're desperate to hear the good news, whether they realize it or not. Romans 10, 13 through 15 gives us some clear direction here as well and a clear call. Verse 13 says this, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How many of you believe that? For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Here's the question. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news. My 
fellow disciples. We, we, you and I, are being sent to the waiting world to tell them the good news about God's love and the salvation through Jesus Christ. If you really believe that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will, will be saved, and you know that there are unsaved people around you, then you have a message that you need to deliver to them. It's a message of salvation. It's a message of God's love for them, the same way it is for you. We need to go and do these things. We are being sent by God himself, have already been sent. We need to rise to the occasion and do what we've already been called to do. And though we are greatly outnumbered and the task can seem overwhelming, we are not at a disadvantage. You need to know that. Because we get, we humanly want to shrink back. Whenever we're outnumbered, we want to shrink back. But guess what? doesn't matter how, what the numbers are. It doesn't matter. It matters whose power you have with you when you show up. So we are not at a disadvantage when it comes to sharing the good news with others. We are speaking. We are living from the winning side. And we are reaching out from that place of victory and inviting others to join us. Not hoping that we're right but knowing that we've already tasted salvation, knowing that it has already changed our lives, and we are inviting them to come and experience the same life change that we have. We're standing in a place of victory, inviting others to live victoriously too. So let me share with you about the advantages that we have when it comes to sharing the good news, because a lot of us tend to shrink back, and we shouldn't. We need to stand boldly and proclaim. So let me share you the advantages that we have. The first advantage we have is this. We speak of God's power. When we speak the good news of Jesus Christ, we are speaking God's power to other people and not our own. This plan of salvation is not my plan. I did not come up with it. It is not any human's plan. It is God's plan. And he is the one that will bring it about as we obey him. And so we need to know, when I speak of the good news, it's not my plan. It's God's plan. And that's why it will succeed. It, it, it is his plan for saving the people of this world from the bondage of sin. And it's his power that will bring it about. And we need to have confidence in that. That when we speak the good news, we are speaking of God's power, not only in our lives, but for all who would believe. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, the Apostle Paul says this, The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it's the very power of God. We who are being saved know it's the very power of God. He goes on to say this in verse 24. But those who, but to those God, um, sorry, but to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of the God. And we who are being saved know that. And we can share that message abundantly with anybody else we want to and say, look, you need to know this too. This is God's power at work in my life. And God's power wants to work in your life. And he wants to save you from your sins. He wants to pull you out of that bondage and set you free. And, and my life testifies that that can really happen in this day and age. And let me share that with you. It's what we need to be doing. It's the power of God in our lives. In the book of Romans, Paul again speaks about his own sense of obli obligation to share the good news. And he acknowledges, even as great as you think the apostle Paul might be, he acknowledges it is not his power that gets it done. It is God's power, not his own. In Romans chapter 1, verses 14 through 17, hear what the apostle Paul has to say to us this morning and he says this for i have a great sense of obligation my desire god's desire would be if you haven't gotten there yet that you will 
that it's not just, oh, I'm glad we have pastors. Oh, I'm glad we have missionaries. But we get to the point where we say, I sense a great obligation. A great obligation to, to tell about the power of God to other people. Because it changed my life. And I know it can change their life. So Paul says, For I have a great sense of obligation to people in both the civilized world and the rest of the world. To the, to the educated and the uneducated alike. So I am eager to come to you in Rome too. To preach the good news. For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes. The Jews first and also the Gentiles. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. My friends, we don't need to be ashamed of the message. We speak of God's power, not our own. We don't have to say, well, I'm super educated, let me tell you, or I'm not educated, I can't speak to you. All we have to say is, you know what? Let me share with you about God's power. That's what we are here to share the message of. Not my own power, but God's power. Paul shared in the power that God gave him. When we share the good news, it is God's power that we speak of. And that's an amazing thing. And it's amazing that he would entrust us with that, isn't it? Because I know me, and you know you. And yet, he trusts us. And he says, I trust you with this message, and I trust you with my power to go and share that with other people. My, my friends, we have been entrusted with that. The second advantage that we have is this. We are empowered by God to speak. We speak of God's power, and we are empowered by God to speak. Now, most of us, if I just came around the room and, and called you up to speak your testimony today, most of you would say, no, 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 no. I don't have the power to speak to other people. And you would be wrong. That is not a true statement at all. That's what the devil wants you to think. But guess what the truth is? You have already been empowered. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have already been empowered to share your testimony and to share the witness of Jesus Christ. We speak, uh, we have been empowered by God to be witnesses for him. We not only speak of God's power, we are empowered to speak. What an amazing thing. We are empowered to speak for him. Jesus himself told us this in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And Jesus says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere. In Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ... You have already been empowered. You may not be using that power, but you have been empowered. God's power has been displayed in your life, so you already have a testimony. And you have been empowered to go and share that with, with other people. God never asks us to do anything that he won't also empower us to do. You need to know that. He will never ask us to do something he won't empower us to do. And he said... You will be my witnesses. But before that, he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. He gives us the power to speak. It goes further than that. He gives us the power to speak and to live the good news out. How many of you know a testimony isn't very good unless the mouth matches the walk? And he gives us the power to do both, not just to speak but then to go and live it out before a watching world so they can see that it truly does work exactly how we say that it does. So we have the power of God that is not a disadvantage, that is an advantage. We have been empowered by God to be witnesses. That is not a disadvantage, that is an advantage. You have been, you have the power of God and you have been empowered by God to speak the good news. 
we see the first disciples, if you remember their story, after Jesus was crucified, they were hiding in fear in the upper room, right? Afraid of the Jewish, or sorry, afraid of the Roman leaders. And after, after Jesus grants them the Holy Spirit and empowers them to be witnesses, we see the disciples boldly standing in front of the Roman leaders and many others, empowered to speak boldly about God's power and message of salvation. And then they don't stop there. They go around the world sharing that over and over and over again. We experience the same empowerment through the Holy Spirit. And it's real, and it's true, and it's for you. And the power is to go and share the good news of Jesus Christ. He wants each and every one of us to do that. The third advantage we have is this. We get to see God's power at work in the lives of others. We get to see God's power at work in the lives of others. Not just in our lives. We've already experienced that. But God says, go and share the message of my power and my salvation and my forgiveness to other people. And then watch my power at work in their lives. That is an advantage. We get to see that happen over and over and over again. And it should encourage us to share more and more of God's power with other people. We speak of God's power. We are empowered by God to speak. And it's his power that changes other people's lives. And let me just say this. It'll change them in ways that we never imagined. But God's power at work is undeniable. And it'll change people in ways that we never would have guessed. But God had a plan for them. And he wanted his power displayed through their lives. Let me give you an example of God's power at work in the life of someone that Peter and John speak to. It's found in Acts uh, chapter uh, 3, verses 1 through 11. Listen for God's power at work in this situation. Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he, put, uh, he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently. And Peter said, look at us. The lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. What did he have? He had the power of God, and he had the message of salvation with him. But I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, Get up and walk. Then Peter took the layman by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. Then walking and leaping and praising God, he went into the temple with them. All the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. When they realized he was the lame beggar, that uh, when they realized that he was a lame beggar they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. They all rushed out in amazement to Solomon's colonnade where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. Peter and John were there to speak about the power of God. They were empowered by God to speak and share the good news of Jesus Christ and to do whatever he would lead them to do. And they were there to witness God's power at work healing this lame man. God did it through them. God's power displayed into another person's life. What an amazing thing. It is God's power that we are able to bring into the lives of other people. What a privilege. What an advantage that is everywhere we go. We are never, never at a disadvantage. We are always at an advantage. 
but Satan wants you to think just the opposite. But when you have God's power that you're speaking of, when you've been empowered by God, you can bring God's power to bear on the lives of those around you. God wants them, those around us, to experience the forgiveness of their sins and the healing of the brokenness in their lives. And he wants to do it through contact with his current faithful followers. That's us. He's asking us to do this. God can work powerfully through us because we have already been transformed by his love and his forgiveness. And we have already been empowered by the Holy Spirit. Why aren't we doing it then? He's called us. He's given us the message. And he is empowering us to do it. We need to do it. It is absolutely amazing what God will do through the life of a person surrendered to him and willing to share the good news with others, both in word and deed. But friends, that's what you were created to do, to be a living witness for Jesus Christ of a life that was forgiven, of a life that was empowered, and a life that was surrendered to go and share the message with other people everywhere we go. As, G- as disciples of Jesus Christ, we are called to put into practice evangelism, sharing the good news about Jesus Christ with others. The truth of the message of God's forgiveness has already changed our lives. And I would say, if it hasn't changed yours, you might want to start there first. It should have already changed our lives. I trust that it has. That's the first step. The the truth of the message of God's forgiveness changes our lives. And then we are empowered to share that same message with others. It's not a different message. It never is. It's always the same message. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you, to forgive your sins and restore your life. It's the same message for all of us, all races, all ethnicities, all age groups. It's the same message, and we're empowered to share that. God wants to work powerfully through our lives to reach more people who are still stuck in their sins and waiting for God's love and forgiveness to come and set them free. Do you know somebody who's stuck? They're waiting for you to share with them the good news that Jesus has already come and that Jesus has already forgiven your sins and he wants to forgive their sins and restore their life too. We hold the message that they're waiting for. So how do we start sharing the good news? How do we start? I know that in the past, many have seen evangelism put into practice in a lot of various ways. We've probably seen street corner preachers, or maybe we've been a part of handing out Bible tracts, or or maybe even handing out Bibles. Those are all effective ways to evangelize. And if God calls you to share the good news in that way, please be obedient and do that. The Lord calls us all to do it in different ways. It could be through singing. For me, it's through preaching. For you, it might be other things. But God calls us to share the good news. Let me share with you how it will look for most of you. For most of you, evangelism is going to look more like a personal conversation that we have with others as God brings people into our lives. I'm not calling on you to go stand on the street corner this afternoon. I'm calling you to listen for the Holy Spirit to speak to you when you're in a conversation with other people. And you know what he'll do? He'll give you the nudge. You need to share. You need to share. You you need to share what I've done in your life. You you see this person is hurting. You see that they're lost, like a sheep without a shepherd. You see that no one's caring for them. The Holy Spirit will nudge us. Tell them. Tell them about me. And guess what you're going to feel? First, you're going to feel afraid. Let me just be honest, right? We're going to feel afraid. But then what you're going to remember is this. Wait a minute. I don't need to be afraid. I've been empowered to do this. And then maybe you breathe a prayer silently. Lord, give me the words to share with this person. They need to know you. And then you can just share. You don't have to memorize tons of scripture or anything. You just have to begin sharing as the Holy Spirit leads and say, what part of my testimony do I need to share with this person? 
They might be stuck in fear or bondage. You can say, look, let me tell you about somebody who set me free from fear and bondage. Maybe you know they're, they're stuck in a sin or something like that. And you can say, you don't, you don't, can I share with you the one who set me free from my sins? For most of us, it's going to just look like a conversation where the Holy Spirit is leading us to share the message of Jesus Christ with that other person who desperately needs to hear it. And we need to not be afraid of those conversations. He's calling us to do them. He's equipped us to do it. And it seems pretty simple, doesn't it? It's a pretty simple way to, to spread the gospel. It's a pretty, it's, it's something that any one of us can do at any age. Just have a conversation. That's what it's going to look like for most of us. I want you to prepare for that. I want you to get ready for that. My fellow disciples, we need to be ready to give a witness for God to anyone the Lord brings into our path. We have to be ready to do that. Let me share with you what Peter shared with the early Christians who were being scattered once again throughout the land and listen to the advice that he gives to them. It's in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. Once again, this, this is Peter speaking. He says this, this letter is from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I am writing to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners in the providence of Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. God the Father knew you and chose you long ago, and his spirit has made you holy. As a result, you have obeyed him. And you have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more grace and peace. Look for just a second at who Peter's writing to. Peter's writing to all the believers, not just the pastors. He's writing to the church there. That's all y'all, right? He is reminding them that they have already experienced God's love and salvation in their own lives. And he calls them holy people. Then a little farther down in the letter, Peter reminds these believers that they are to, uh, that as they go through their lives, even in the midst of suffering, which they're going through, they are to be sharing their faith with other people. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses uh, 15 and 16 say this. <clears throat> Instead, you must worship Christ as the Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always call the pastor. Is that what it says? Oh, wait, that's not what it says at all. Wait, wait, let's read it again. Instead, you... That's who he was talking to, the church. All you people who have already been changed by God's power, who have already been forgiven, who have already been cleansed, who have already been called holy, all of you who are living your lives in worship of Jesus Christ, if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, Always be ready to explain it, but do this in a gentle and respectful way. Always be ready. Are you ready this morning? The Lord has already given us his power to speak about. He has already empowered us. I'm going to go out on a limb and say he has already put people around you who need to hear the good news. They're waiting on us to do our part, to go and speak graciously and kindly about the love that has changed our lives. My fellow disciples, that advice from Peter is great advice for us. Let's be ready to give an exam, uh, uh, an ex let's be ready to explain the hope, the love, and the forgiveness that we've already experienced through Jesus Christ. Let's share with a gen in a gentle and respectful way and then allow the power of God to work in their lives as it did in ours. We don't have to make them pray the prayer. 
We don't have to make them do anything. We just have to share the power of God's love with them like somebody did with us. And guess what? He'll take care of the rest. His power will change their lives just like it changed ours. Let's be ready to give an answer. Would you stand as I give us a closing prayer this morning? Heavenly Father, thank you for the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, that someone came and told us. I don't know who it was, but Lord, you sent someone to every one of us. And to some of us, you sent two and three and four and five people to continue to share that there is salvation through Jesus Christ, that we can be forgiven of our sins and that we can be cleansed and made whole and we can be set free from the bondage. Father, thank you for sending someone to us so that we could be forgiven, so that we could believe and be saved. Lord, thank you that your message didn't end before someone shared it with us. Father, would you impress upon us the obligation that we need to go and share that same message with others. It's not a new message. It's the same message that's, that transformed our lives. It's a message in the power of God as we share the message of Jesus Christ. Lord, would you help us to begin to feel that urge and that burden to share that message with others that they too might find the love that you have for them, the forgiveness that you have for them, and the restoration of your life, of their life that you have for them. And Lord, may they then go and be excited to tell others as well. Father, thank you for all that you've done. Thank you that the message of salvation is for everyone who believes. We praise you for that, and we thank you for that. Thank you for including each and every one of us in your salvation plan. You are a good, good God. And Lord, we praise you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to give you a special benediction this morning. So listen closely. Just as Peter spoke to his people, I'm going to speak to the people that the Lord has put in front of me. I am speaking to God's chosen people. You who are living in Connellsville, Bullskin, Dunbar, Scottdale, Mount Pleasant, and all the surrounding areas and those watching online. God the Father knew you, and he chose you long ago, and his spirit has made you holy and empowered you. As a result, you have obeyed him and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more grace and peace as you are now sent out to share the good news with others. Go in the love of the Father the grace of the Lord Jesus, and the power of the Holy Spirit, and share the good news with those around you. You are dismissed. <clears throat>